Well, good evening, Brian, and welcome to the 20th Zoom meeting presented by the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337 here in the province of Fife and Kinross under the constitution of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. It's a beautiful day outside, and Brian, I'm delighted that you've uh, decided to come indoors and experience some Masonic education with us this evening. I'm particularly delighted that we've got a brother from Canada who's going to present to us this evening. Before introducing a uh, worshipful brother Bruce, however, uh, can I just remind you all of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines into our Zoom meetings. Uh, I need you to have your screens named and for you to keep your videos live so we know who you are. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube channels uh, later on this evening. Can I ask you all to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages so we've got a record of it for posterity. Uh, all chats uh, and questions for Brother Bruce later on this evening can I ask you to put into the chat and hopefully we'll have a really good discussion. Uh, I have seen the presentation, Brian, and I think it follows on very nicely from some of the other uh, stories that we've heard, uh, particularly around the, the Jacobites and the Scottish diaspora. Uh, so it gives me the greatest of pleasure, Brian, to welcome this evening Worshipable Brother Bruce Zawalski uh, from Canada. He is actually out on manoeuvres uh, in, the, in the Great Plains, I think, and he'll probably tell us a little bit more about that as we go into the evening. So welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, Bruce. Well, thank you very much, brother. I, I quite appreciate that. And yes, as you can see, I am uh, uh, in the middle of my work day. But one of the things I've noticed is as a sergeant major, if the sergeant major disappears, the troops generally are just happy. And so I'm thinking maybe I can just catch a couple of hours and they'll never know. Uh, so, yeah, so welcome, brethren, and uh, my name is uh, Very Worshipful Brother Bruce Sawalski. I am a past master of Greaseball Lodge, which is a lodge founded in 1964 all by um, uh, World War II veterans, and it's a lodge that's probably still 50 or 60 percent veterans or serving members of either the regular force or the reserve army or navy or air force in Canada. And uh, what I'd like to do is just fire my screen up here. And everyone can see that screen now? Good. All right, so what I'd like to talk about today is Freemasonry and the fall of New France. And it's a story about the first Masonic lodges to operate in Canada. And I have a viewpoint as a Canadian soldier and as an Alberta Mason, and some of, that, um, some of that stuff will come through here, but I do try to state approvable facts. As well, I think the law of unintended consequence applies to many things in this story. History is inevitable and past changes can, can be rectified because we're Freemasons. So this presentation was originally done as an after dinner speech in our Greaseball Lodge military mess dinner. So we run a full military mess dinner every single year, usually, uh, usually in March, so strangely enough, March or April, ours got canned this year. And um, it was an after dinner speech, so a few things in it apply to that. But what I've done is I've added extra detail because originally there was no, uh, there was nothing, no PowerPoint, and some paintings, and I hope you will enjoy this version of the presentation. So ancient ritual is the DNA of Freemasonry. It's what binds us together as brothers. It's what makes us Freemasons. Discipline and drill is the DNA of all professional militaries since the Roman legions first marched along their cobbled roads to do battle. It's what binds together all professional soldiers into an ancient fraternity. Now in Canada, those two strands joined together first at Quebec in the winter of 1759. So what I'd like to talk today, or the question today is, did the capture of New France and the formation of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Canada create the conditions that caused Canadian masonry to become linked to the moderns of England and diminish our historic ties to the ancients and to Scotland? So before I go, I need to talk about the Seven Year War. And I need to go back to it because it was the first real global war. It was really the first world war. It started in North America in the French Indian Wars and was fought on four continents, America, Asia, Africa, and all over Europe. Pitting uh, Britain, Prussia, Portugal, the Iroquois Confederation, and the Protestant princes of Germany against nearly every European power, including the most powerful Catholic countries of the time, France, Austria, and Spain, 
along with Sweden, Russia, the Abernaki Confederation, and the Mongol Empire. The French-Indian Wars was the proving grounds of many of the junior officers who fought on both sides of the American Revolution, and it literally changed the map of North America forever. The map you see there is not the map of the country I live in or anywhere else. It's simply gone. Now, the campaign itself was incredibly complex. Fought in the middle of this obviously seven-year-long war, it followed several major steps. It did not start with the Siege of Quebec and the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. And, or end with the Battle of General Wolfe. And this per picture is one of those beautiful pictures that has nothing to do with reality. There's a couple of Iroquois uh, warriors on the side kneeling down, watching Wolfe die. They hated his guts, and they would never have been there. But it, it's a nice story, and that's just that, how it works, right? And you know, in our National Gallery, we like to put this kind of stuff up. So let's talk about the actual campaign. The actual campaign was in eight steps. The first step and the most important was the fall of the fortress of Louisbourg in 17, uh, July 1758. So without Louisbourg captured, they could never siege Quebec. The inland campaign was the other part of it. And the inland campaign take, took a long time, but most importantly, it included the fall of Fort Frontenac in August of 1758. So once Louisbourg was captured and Fort Frontenac was captured, then they could actually siege Quebec. Right? So that was the next step, which is the Siege of Quebec Battle of Plains of Abraham in 17, in sept ending in September 1759. The surrender of Quebec and the later occupation took some time to negotiate and organize and conduct peacefully. So they simply did not cap capture the city. They defeated the French. The French then, they negotiated with the French and the French gave up. The one that you don't see here in terms of this map is the second most important thing after the, the capture of Lewisburg. And that is the decisive na British naval victory in the Battle of Cabirion Bay in November, 1759. It ended any realistic French hope of invading Scotland or even really resupplying New France. Cabirion Bay is literally the Tafalagar of the Seven Year Wars. And that's how you should think of it in terms of that idea of it ended the French idea that they were going to invade anywhere. Right? That was just done. The next thing that happened was number six, and that's the critical work in fixing the fortifications of Quebec. So essentially, the French had not kept their fortifications up to date. It's why they didn't, uh, they surrendered once they were beaten on the Plains of Abraham. As soon as the British got in there, they set to work every regiment, all of their artillery, and any of the Royal Navy ratings who were left behind in re-fortifying Quebec. And they spent the entire winter doing that, ripping apart houses for material and everything else. And uh, number seven was the French victory at the Battle of St. Froy in April, 1760. So the French weren't completely destroyed then. They still owned Montreal and they still had a garrison in Montreal. That garrison marched into to Quebec, beat the British. The British simply retreated back behind their newly fortified and rebuilt walls and said, no, nah, we're not leaving. And then the resupply of the British happened because of Cabrillon Bay, there was no chance of a resupply of the French. And once resupply and reinforcements arrived, they simply walked into Montreal, that literally. And that ended with the surrender of Montreal in September, 1760. Now that surrender did not end the war. It that war continued to 1763 with the signing of the Treaty of Paris and the permanent surrender of New France. Now, sadly, I always mention this for our Quebec brothers in Canada, that the French government traded New France on the negotiating table for sugar a producing colony in the Caribbean. Yep, sugar in the tea and coffee in Paris was far more important than Quebec. So that's just a sad thing. Now, the other one that we have to always talk about is the bugbear in the back room. And that's a reminder that the Jacobite risings of 1745 and 1746 and the Battle of Culloden were only 13 years before the fall of Quebec. The Jacobites were not totally crushed. Bonnie Prince Charles was alive and in exile in France. France still hoped to invade Britain until Cabrillon Bay with an army of 100,000 supported by Jacobite exiles. The Highland clearances were ongoing, so they hadn't been completed, and the House of Hanover was not yet completely secure. Many of the rituals we share as soldiers in this turbulent period of British history still go on. 
And for example, if I was a mess, at a mess dinner and I had a glass of port, I could not toast my port over water because even today, our mess stewards clear the water glasses so we cannot toast the king over the water. Right, and that still goes on. And people ask, well, why do we clear it? It would save a lot of trouble, but we still do that. As well, the 47th foot started wearing black lace in mourning for Wolf's death. And the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, which I am a member of, is affiliated with that regiment. And we still use black as our most important regimental color because of it, right? So let's talk about the first Grand Lodge in Canada. And that's formation. So during the three month siege of Quebec, bombardment and damage uh, and, uh, damaged nearly all buildings, leaving little food and no fuel in a cold climate. Soldiers were living upon salted provisions without fresh vegetables and scurvy was rampant. Seriousness can be gathered from a muster roll of the Fraser Highlanders who started the war with a strength of 1200 in 1760. Out of their surviving total of 894 men, 580, including their CO, was, was in hospital. So the majority of the regiment, the regiment was literally reduced to just a little over 200. So the first joint meeting of the lodge in the freshly captured fortress and city of Quebec was held November 28, 1759, which was as soon as convenient after the surrender of this place to Her Britannic Majesty's arms. So on a cold Wednesday evening in a shattered city, a group of soldiers met a mixture of English, Irish, and Scotsmen. Both soldiers and officers were present, present, some wounded and with torn and worn uniforms from a tough summer and fall of campaigning in the Canadian wilderness. One of the things to remember is if you were a private soldier or even a senior NCO, you only had one uniform. And when that uniform wore out, you went bankrupt trying to buy a new one, <laughs> right? And so only the officers would have had baggage and spare uniforms. Painting is a beautiful painting, but sadly inaccurate as almost everyone appears to be wearing modern regalia, uh, which of course they weren't wearing at the time. So let's talk about who was actually there. There was present were seven regiment of foots, including the 15th regiment of foot, which had lodge number 245 on the Grand Lodge of Ireland. So one of the things we'll notice is almost all the lodges were from the Irish registry because the Grand Lodge of Ireland allowed lodges that were movable or transportable in terms of military lodges. The 17th of foot had Lodge 136, the Grand Lodge of Ireland. The 28th of foot actually had two lodges, one of the oldest lodges there, Lodge number 35 in the Grand Lodge of Ireland, and one of the newest lodges, Lewisburg number one, from the Provincial uh, Grand Lodge of Boston, which, we, uh, which would be um, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts today. As well, the 42nd foot had a lodge under dispensation from Lodge 136. So there was a Scottish lodge getting a dispensation from an English regiment of foot using a, an Irish constitution. So if that's not British, I don't know what else is, right? That's just simply the way that is. Um, another one that was there was the 47th foot and that were the Loyals or Wolf's Own. Now this picture has the black lace on, the, uh, on their, um, on their um, uh, hats, which of course this is from the Revolutionary War. They wouldn't have worn them that quickly, right? And there's also the 48th of foot, which had uh, a lodge number 218 of the Grand Lodge of Ireland. Another lodge present was the Royal Regiment of Artillery, which had again a lodge uh, uh, under dispensation from Lodge 195. And so, um, that's how that system worked. There was also brothers from the 78th or the Fraser Highlanders were present at the first meeting, but they had no lodge at the time. It didn't take very long for them to get a lodge, but they didn't have a lodge at the time. And of course, one of the reasons was is in terms of that they were, they were a, a, a regiment that was founded or mustered for that war. And so they really didn't have a time to organize it or create that in, in that. The 78th Highlanders did have one later. As well, as we'll talk about later, the Grand Lodge of Scotland didn't give dispensations for traveling lodges. Uh, the 46th was also present, or it participated in the Wilderness Campaign. It had Lodge 227 of the Grand Lodge of Ireland. It operated in 1760 against Montreal, but may not have been present at the meeting. Then there's, uh, there's some controversy in terms of if they were present or not. Since no one has any real minutes of it, then that's a problem. So what was agreed? This we know. 
What was agreed, it was considered and agreed upon as there were so many lodges in this garrison that one brother, present of the greatest skill and merit, should take upon him the name of the Grand Master from the authority of the above lodges until such a time as a favorable opportunity should offer for obtaining a proper sanction for, from the right worshipful and right honorable, the Grand Master of England. And in consequence thereof, our true and faithful brother, Mr. John Price Gannett, Lieutenant in His Majesty's 47th Regiment, was unanimously into the great satisfaction of the whole fraternity assembled proclaimed Grand Master for the ensuing year. So the first Grand Master in Canada was Lieutenant John Price Gannett of the 47th. Unfortunately, he disappeared very quickly from the story because his regiment was sent south in the spring and he literally died within a year fighting in the Caribbean and he disappeared from the story. Now, a point to consider. Nearly all lodges used ancient ritual created well prior to 1745. That ritual would be considered to have Jacobitean inclinations by the principal Grand Lodge of England. Nearly every Mason present was in the army, but military lodges had officers, senior NCOs, and soldiers intermixed in a way not seen in the class conscious British society, and certainly not in London lodges. So as an example of a military lodge in the British army, I need to go to the War of Independence where I found some nice statistics in terms of a mixed a makeup of a lodge just before Bunker Hill. And that was the 59th foot or the second Nottinghamshire uh, Lodge. They had 14 brothers, the Lieutenant Colonel, i.e. the Colonel of the Regiment, a Major, two Lieutenants, the Surgeon, the Music Master, three Sergeants, two Corporals and three Privates. That is a very different organization in terms of that. And I can say when I joined as a young Sergeant in Greaseball Lodge, we had that very thing. Colonels all the way down to Corporals. Uh, and, and of course, a Lodge, in the British Army was one very interesting place because it was the only place where a corporal could be a serving master and the CO was serving steward. So what choices did they have to create this Grand Lodge? Who therefore could they go to with Masonic authority? So what were their real choices? Why did they pick the, the uh, Grand Master of the Premier Grand Lodge of England? Well, the first choice could have been to go to the ancient Grand Lodge of England. Unfortunately, it was very new. It had only been established in 1751. And none of them had an affiliation with the ancient Grand Lodge of England, okay? You think, well, they could have gone to the Grand Lodge of Scotland, right? Established in 1736, but there was no traveling lodges in the Grand Lodge of Scotland at the time. So that was an option that really wasn't on the table for them, unless they wanted to set some Masonic history. Now you think, since almost every one but one of those lodges had their um, charter from the Grand Lodge of Ireland, they'd go there. But unfortunately, even though they were, the, the Grand Lodge of Ireland was established in 1725, they had no provincial Grand Lodges yet. And even today, the two lodges that are military lodges that still travel with regiments of the British Army do not have a uh, district. They are under the Grand Master directly. And of course, one of them is, is, is the Royal Scots Dragoons, which is kind of funny where you say, well, there it is, there's, a, a, there's again, a Scottish regiment in the British Army with its charter from the Grand Lodge of Ireland even today, right? So fourth choice would have been the Provincial Grand Lodge of New England because that was the closest Grand Lodge. And one of the lodges was from there, right? Lewisburg number one, but that probably was washed away because it simply was a Provincial Grand Lodge. And they would probably have thought the Grand Master wouldn't have the authority to set up another Provincial Grand Lodge. So they went, to the premier Grand Lodge of England. Established, of course, in what year? Everybody knows the answer to that, but it's all a lie. It wasn't 1717, it was at least 1721, as the Apple Tree Tavern was not built until 1728. And unfortunately, the minutes of Lodge of London Lodge number two from 1721 has recently been discovered. So we should curse all pesky secretaries for keeping real records and notes because it um, unfortunately proved that 1717 was picked for a reason. And I got a great, great presentation if one day you wanna hear it in terms of why they picked the date, but it had nothing to do with reality. So they went to the Premier Grand Lodge of England and then they said, who therefore did they petition? So when they sent this in, they're making a petition into a Grand Master and who they petitioned was Lord Abadour, Sholta Douglas, a Scottish nobleman who from 17, 57 to 1762 was the Grand Master of the Principal Grand Lodge of England. At the time, he was a colonel of the 17th Regiment of Light Dragoons throughout its short existence. 
uh, the regiment never left the UK. It was raised to simply beat off that French invasion that never occurred. And in the Grand Lodge, he was more of a figurehead. He was the son of a very important and very skilled Freemason with a great history in masonry. And that it was his father, the 14th Earl of Morton, James Douglas, a Scottish astronomer, who was both the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Scotland and the Grand Lodge of England. He was also uh, uh, imprisoned in France, probably a Jacobite, because he left with the Jacobites, but for some reason the French didn't trust him or didn't like him and they imprisoned him. He didn't like a French prison, so he went back to Scotland and uh, eventually also became the president of the Royal Society in 1764. The real person who ran the Grand Lodge would be Samuel Spencer, who served as the Grand Secretary until 1768, and along with the Deputy Grand Master, basically ran the Grand Lodge day to day. So let's uh, follow the passage of change. Why did this make a difference? Well, the difference was that the news of the meeting and a letter with 20 pounds, which is $5,500 Canadian, probably about 3,500 pounds, right, today, and was carried back to them by a brother, Thomas Dunkersley, who was an English Freemason initiated in Portsmouth in 1754. So in a, a, a modern English lodge in Portsmouth. And at the time he was a 35 year old master gunner. And so a master gunner would have been one of the five senior warrant officers in a ship of the line. So I am a warrant officer, if you can see that, a master warrant officer or in the, uh, the British system, a, w, um, a, a W-2. But, um, Effectively, it was a different system in the Royal Navy. In the Royal Navy, they had petty officers who do my role in, in, in the ship. They also had warrant officers and they were given their warrants because they were specialists. So things like the master gunner, uh, the chaplain, the school teacher for the um, midshipmen and uh, the surgeons. And they were given those positions so that they could be part of the officer's mess, but they could never accidentally command the ship. So only the officers commanded the ship. So that was the idea. They had commissions, they were allowed to command the ship. And his ship was not that ship you see on the screen, but that's a similar uh, sister ship of it. It was the HMS Vanguard, which was a 70 gun ship of the line with two decks. And it was in Quebec, but it was leaving for England. So there it was, the choice of the curie, courier just seemed so simple at the time. You had a literate Freemason going back to London. Ah, this is perfect right? And little did any of the brothers guess that their choice of a courier would have such a profound effect on masonry in both England and North America. So, Dunkersley's fortune changed incredibly quickly. He arrived back in England. His mother had just died. He attended his mother's funeral and was told on his, of his mother's deathbed confession that he was the illegitimate son of the deceased Frederick, Prince of Wales and therefore the half-brother of Prince George, the present uh, Prince of Wales, and therefore the grandson of the reigning King George II. So this changed him an awful lot. It also was not surprising that it increased his status in London Freemasonry, because that was Freemasons Hall then. And if you go to London now, you may be surprised that the Freemasons Hall there is a little bit bigger and a little nicer. And um, let's face it, the principal Grand Lodge of England in 1760 needed patrons, and a member of the House of Hanover, even a bastard son of the Prince of Wales' dead father, was better than nothing, especially when he walked into the Grand Secretary's office with a large bag of cash. Never overrate walking into an office with a large bag of cash. And so he certainly did. And interestingly enough, when he came back to Quebec with the British fleet, he was the master of a lodge. And you go, well, that's interesting. How did he do that? Well, he established it himself in HMS Vanguard. And he then moved it on in 1762 to HMS Prince, which is the ship you see there. And it was a, he got a promotion effectively to a same job, but to a hundred gun, three deck, first rate ship of the line. He then took that lodge to London Tavern and it's still now, it's, that lodge still exists now as London Lodge number 108. Now, why did he do that? How could he do that? Well, interestingly enough, the Grand Master gave him a warrant empowering him to look into the craft wheresoever he might go. So he could just form lodges and appoint people and do whatever he wanted, as long as he didn't do it in London, which is kind of interesting. 
So in virtue of that authority on St. John's Day in 1760, he installed Colonel Simon Fraser of Levant as successor to Gannett as the provincial Grand Master. Fraser was a reformed Jacobite. His, his father was the last man beheaded in the UK. Uh, he, he arrived late in Culloden, which um, some people said was on purpose and other people said he was just slow. Whatever the case may be, he got imprisoned after that. His father was beheaded. And while in prison, he studied law. And when, uh, after his uh, release, when the war started, he actually raised the 78th from members of his own clan. So he was the individual who raised the, uh, the actual Fra uh, uh, Fraser Highlanders and obviously their first uh, commanding officer. He went on to become a general, right? But that was later in, in, in his career. Now, Brothers Dunkersley's Masonic career was very interesting. His newly acquired Hanover ancestry, a strong attachment to the moderns, which is where he came from, and later contempt for the ancient, um, ancients, this installation was greatly satisfying and it raised his status. He firmly established the moderns in Quebec, the ancients had been jockeyed out, a term he used in a, lot, a number of his writings later, and he under, certainly understood where his bread would be buttered. Dunkersley became a prominent Freemasonry, Freemason in England. He was appointed the provincial grand master of several provinces and actually helped extend the system of provincial grand masters. So one of the reasons we have 60 lodges, grand lodges in North America, was the provincial grand lodge system that he made sure went to the American colonies. And therefore it stretched into Canada and every single province said, well, we got to have our own. We're our own province, we're gonna have our own Grand Lodge. And it doesn't matter how, how few lodges we actually have, right? Uh, he re wrote several Masonic degrees and worked closely with the gentleman on the right, William Preston in these reforms. I'll put double quotes around those reforms as I have some things to say about that personally, but he did promote Mark Masonry and Royal Arch Masonry in England but pushed both as completely separate organizations. So he worked hard to create a uniformity and a ritual in these organizations. So in Scotland, Mark Master, degrees, uh, Mark Master Mason degrees part of a lodge, at least most places, and the Royal Arch degrees was at the time at least conducted by many Scottish and English lodges when they had candidates. So he separated all that out and created the system that as a Freemason in Alberta, I've inherited, right? Now, how is this made possible? Because obviously he's running around being provincial grand master, all these other things. It doesn't pay any, any, any pay. Well, it's made possible by an annuity obtained by King George III by his claim of being his illegitimate half-brother. So he showed up and he looked an awful lot like his brother and they said, oh, he must be. And they gave him a yearly payment of 800 pounds or $220,000 Canadian or about, oh, 175,000 pounds a year, tax-free and a palace apartment. So he did well for that and that, that helped it. So let's look at the results. Well, the Provincial Grand Lodge of Quebec became an important Masonic body. For 33 years, it kept control of masonry in Quebec under the principal Grand Lodge of England. It chartered during its time 40 subordinate lodges. The first four being located in Quebec, Albion number two, now a French speaking lodge, St. Num John's number three, the last English speaking lodge in Quebec City. There's a number of them in, in Montreal and elsewhere in Quebec, but not, but not in Quebec City. And it still operates in the, present, in the present Grand Lodge of Quebec. It exercises Masonic jurisdiction over an extensive area east to Fredericton, New Brunswick, which is a major uh, fort. Uh, at the time, and still a major base of the Canadian Army. Everybody in the infantry or armor or artillery or, or, and, or um, engineers, if you want to be a senior NCO or an officer, you go there to train. It's still a very, very important base. West to Fort Detroit and south to the Virginies in Vermont. So among the lodges that met that night, Lodge 227 still survives. Granted a traveling warrant on March 4th, 1752, the Lodge of Military and Social Virtue, number 227, traveled with the 46th Regiment of Foot. Their regalia and Bible was captured by American forces under Washington in October 1778, but nearly immediately returned by Washington under a flag of truce. And the Lodge operated in the with the regiment until 1855. But by that point, down to four brothers, they transferred from a traveling military lodge into a permanent semi-military lodge in, by virtue of just complete luck where they happened to be garrisoned at the time, Montreal, Quebec. 
where they were stationed. So it is now called the Lodge of Antiquity Number One AF and AMGRQ on the registry of the Grand Lodge of Quebec, and it meets on the third Wednesday in downtown Montreal. And um, I am looking. I have that on the list of lodges I would like to visit. So what really changed? Well, the oldest lodges in Canada were modern in their disposition. Dunkersley pushed forward the provincial grand lands system in the in, in, in the principal grand lodge uh, of England, and are therefore our grand lodge in our grand lodges in North America inherited the organization and constitution of the ultra conservative provincial grand lodges of England. Provincial grand lodges were in place when the U.S. rebelled and when we gained our independence in Canada, and because of that, then you had that system that every province or every um, state in the U.S. would have a provincial grand lodge. Um, Dunkersley helped the movement out of taverns and into specially built buildings, i.e. temples or halls. So he was part of the people that pushed that along. He also separated the Mark Master Mason and the Royal Arch Degree from craft lodges, both with uh, separate organizations and uniform rituals. This meant, unfortunately, it was really easy to inherit the American system of having them as separate from craft lodges or craft masonry. Unfortunately, along this bumpy road, we traveled together, my brothers, individual lodges lost many of the freedom. So the cobbled road ahead. If freedom is our mantra here in the West, where is the freedom with, uh, within masonry? Where are the vastly different rituals alive in the 1750s? Freemasonry in the 1600s and 1700s was not at all conservative. It was vibrant, alive, and a fire of freedom and a beacon of light. We have allowed our institutions to grow old and stagnant, or, and we have mixed up and forgotten our ties to the ancient Scotland, and Scotland. Instead, we bandy about history of Knights Templars and keep enforced a rigidity of ritual not practiced by our ancient brethren. My brethren, uh, Wolf caused profound changes in Canada, but not irreversible for Canadian masonry. We were not removing Jacobitean in tendencies. Instead, we removed profound parts of our ancient ritual, pasteurized it to remove the hard to explain, make it homogeneous and setting Set, set, setting us within an, an order acceptable to our rulers past and present. Now I'm profoundly grateful to the many researchers who have brought forward the real history of modern masonry and the enlightenment and the darker times of Freemasonry afterwards. Sadly, many of them were looking for what? They were looking for a Templar connection and that was only there in legend. But of course, what is Freemasonry but a system of allegory illustrated by symbols? So instead, our wrong turn was a byproduct of anti-Jacobite response by the British Crown and the principal Grand Lodge of England that changed Freemasonry in profound and lasting ways. But we must remember, it did one thing that we should always be internally grateful for. It propelled it forward to vast numbers of men and women around the globe. The reason we have so many Masons was the British Army's travels in whatever, whether they were English regiments, Scottish regiments, or Irish regiments. They brought Masonry to the world. Thank you, my brethren, and I will open it for questions. Bruce, on behalf of the Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our visitors here this evening, can I thank you very much for a really entertaining and informative lecture. Uh, th there's a couple of things that you possibly are not aware of that connects what you've said to the province of Fife and Kinross. Uh, some of the brethren from Fife and Kinross may not be aware of this either, Bruce. Uh, but you talked about uh, Sholto Charles Douglas, Lord Aberdour. Uh, he was a member of Lodge St. John 60 here in Fife and Inverkeithing. And we have got Aberdour as one of the villages here. And the 42nd of Foot is the Black Watch, and that's our local regiment to Fife and Tayside. Right. So, I know that we've got a host of questions in the chat room for you. Uh, so let me just find the first one. Oh, I, I will answer the one I can see, which is the Simon Fraser mentioned in the famous pipe band in University of British Columbia is a different Simon Fraser. He's the, he, was a, he would have been an explorer who actually, uh, um, so I'm not sure where, he, where his history is, but it's definitely, the Fraser River is named after the explorer Simon Fraser, not the Colonel Simon Fraser. Okay, that's great. So there's a question in the private chat. Question re military lodges. Could Bruce talk about officers and privates within a lodge? He touched on it. 
it is something I've thought quite a bit about. Yeah, I mean, from my experience, I mean, it was my colonel who got me into the lodge after I discovered he was a Freemason. Um, but in the lodge, I've never seen anything where we weren't completely on the level together. You know, and they have different jobs and I have had a different responsibilities and everything else. And I never saw anybody give, a, give anybody a break. But that's not relevant in the fact that you had, you know, we had, um, I, a matter of fact, I had a, a captain as my um, uh, senior warden when I was master, right? So that was, you know, um, I've never seen a problem with that. I know that I've heard that they had a thing supposedly that they wouldn't allow in, they wouldn't bring in anybody until they were a sergeant, but none of the actual um, minutes or anything that comes with that says that that's actually true. And, you know, and it, I mean, it may have, you know, some people are saying, oh, well, if they were already a Freemason, then they would have done that. But most guys would have been joining as boy soldiers and in the, in the ranks. So it's unlikely that any of them were Freemasons. Now, some of them might have been, right? And of course, if you were a Freemason already, then of course they would, they would let you into the, you know, the military lodge within that, um, within that regiment. But I, I would see nothing in terms of them, you know, not like if somebody decided that they were going to bring a person in, I don't think that that it would be any lodge rules would say they wouldn't bring in a private or a corporal or anything else. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. I've got another question. We had Brother Moses Gomez speak to us uh, a good few weeks ago about the Underground Railroad, and he touched on the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in the United States. Is Prince Hall active in Canada or is it all under the state and provincial Grand Lodge or province Grand Lodges? No, no, they are active in Canada. They're much smaller in Canada except Ontario uh, in terms of the number of lodges, but they're still, they're, they're, they're definitely active in, um, in Canada. There's a Prince Hall Lodge in Edmonton. Okay, thank you. There doesn't seem to be any. There's one just coming. Um, so the brother Bob Scott's asking. He's saying, first of all, he's really enjoyed your presentation, and particularly your delivery. And I think everyone else will uh, commend you on that as well. His question. Uh, he's asking about the name of the lodge, uh, Greaseball. Uh, it's unusual. Where did it come from? Oh, okay. So it was named after the founder of the, uh, the first colonel of the uh, 49th Battalion, the Loyal, which became the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, Colonel Griesbaugh. And uh, Colonel Griesbaugh, even though it's a German name, he, you know, he was a bagpipe playing um, um, uh, young officer. And uh, his, his father was an, uh, um, one of the original inspectors who came with the Northwest Mounted Police. So we would be part of the German community that came over as, um, and settled um, in terms of um, uh, re relatives who would have been part of the um, uh, Protestant Germans who came you know, with, with the king. And there were vast numbers of them settled across Western Canada. And so it's named after Colonel Griesbaugh who eventually um, Founded the regiment, was the commander of the regiment for most of the First World War, and then went on to become a brigadier general. Okay, thank and you. And he's a prominent Freemason in Edmonton. He was, as a boy, he was the mayor of Edmonton. Literally, like 19 years old, he got elected mayor. He was a very prominent citizen, and um, as a soldier, sort of second to none. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Did military lodges in Canada initiate people outside of the regiment, civilians, for example? Well, true military lodges did because they would have founded other lodges in one way or another. Now, you know, like say, you know, Greaseball Lodge, we were, we were only military in our disposition because it was veterans who founded the lodge. But the, the military lodges that I've um, run into in terms of talking to people that worked in these ones or anything, or when you look at any of the histories, all of it appears to be that they certainly let people and initiated individuals when they moved to new cities, often so that they could form their own lodges. Okay, thank you. Another question in the, the private chat for you, Bruce. 
was Dunkerley actually an illegitimate royal? I've read that this has oh. been doubted in more recent research. Correct. Yeah, no, there is, I mean, there, there, there's, um, you know, he, he, whatever it is, he got away with it, <laughs> you know, and um, whether it was, you know, it was true or not, there, I mean, you know, there's people that say yes, no, and that difference. And I mean, the only way you want to really solve it, you could pull his grave up and do a DNA test. <laughs> right. But I mean, in the end, I'm not sure if any, you know, he got away with it. And I think that's, and that's what created the history. It's not really, in my books, it's not relevant if he really was one or not. I know there is, I've read a little bit, especially recently, uh, trying to uh, claiming that, you know, for various reasons, he's, he wasn't. Yeah. Okay, you know, if you look so. at the picture, kind of looks like his half-brother a bit. You know? Same artist. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, a question about your slide, November the 28th, 1759. There are white lines on the floor. Any thoughts on what they mean? Oh, I looked at those too, and I have no idea. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it, it's not a standard board. I mean, I, I, I would, I, I, that was one of the first questions I'd ask when I got to the Lodge of Antiquity. We've got a, a comment for you from Harry Conway. Bruce, the Society of the Red Carnation keep alive the Jacobite history. So that will be a, a Google one for you. I, <clears throat> another comment I, about Dunkerley. Yes, it was an elaborate myth. His baptismal certificate was located, uh, I just moved out of the screen. His baptismal, uh, baptismal certificate was located by a lady, Professor Dr. Susan Summers. Uh, can you give some more information on this? Uh, it's just what you've uh, said already, yeah. No, no, that's my sum total of my, I, I've read a little bit about him just because he's an interesting character and he had so much to do with Canadian Freemasonry, but I've never did any, I've never done any research into him. Okay. Here's an interesting question. I uh, thank you, really appreciated the talk. My daughter is in the army and she has many male friends, also fellow officers. Would you say it is advantageous to be a Mason whilst in the army? What advice could you give to help me recruit them? Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I found that personally, I mean, the reason we have, so, you, know, you, you know, we have so many loyal Eddie officers and senior NCOs in our lodge is we have so, because we're, we're all in the same messes together, right? That's what tends to bring the guys to join because you get to know them and they find out you're a Freemason and they ask, or you, you know, and then it comes up in a question one way or another. I mean, is it, is that useful? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really handy thing and it's probably why there's really more senior NCOs and officers. You know, I think we have one corporal in our, in that and he's retired. Right. So one of that's one of the things they seem, we seem to attract those people that we, we know. I mean, that's how you, that's how you get new Masons. Yeah. Uh, I, I must admit, Bruce, when I, when I served in the Royal Air Force, I was in Germany, uh, the headquarters Royal Air Force Germany, and I went to a few lodge meetings and it was all ranks. And the rank slides came off when we went into the lodge and into Harmony. Right. So I, I visit a lodge in the barracks in Calgary on several occasions. Has that lodge moved to Edmonton now? Hmm. So, if it met in, I um, definitely did not. If it was in the meeting there, it would have been, I don't even know what lodge it would be. Ron, do you, Ron, do you want to unmute yourself and say what lodge it was? No. Okay. Uh, a question from one of our fe my fellow masters of one of our research lodges. Do Canadian lodges have the Mark degree or is the Mark Lodge separated as it is in England? Uh, yeah, the, well, well, neither. Um, in, in Alberta, or then really in all of North America, effectively, the Mark Master Mason's degree is run by the Royal Arch. Okay. And so I'm a... I'm Mark Master Mason, I'm a, a past master of my uh, uh, Norwood chapter of the, uh, of the Royal Arch in Alberta, but we, we do the Mark degree and then we also do a most excellent master degree, which isn't the excellent master degree that we inherited from the Americans and can't seem to get rid of. Um, and that's the system that we got. 
and for whatever reason it came through and we we did, took ne we took neither the british system or the scottish system we took the american system when it came to the royal arch okay thank you bruce mike kern you've got a comment on dunkerley i think do you want to unmute yourself and chip in yes uh, can you i hope you can all hear me in uh, 2009 i gave a presentation to the international conference of the history of freemasonry in edinburgh on freemasonry at sea and this was basically about masonic lodges that met on board ship now one of the people that i touched on was thomas dunkley and also uh, in general the uh, comments that you made bruce i can actually fact echo however I was later approached by a certain Dr. Susan Mitchell Summers, who came over to England and did an awful lot of research into Dunkley. Now, she was able to locate, among many papers, a, a, some church somewhere, probably in around the Portsmouth area or even London, his baptismal certificate that actually verified that his father was not the royal personage where we mention, but was his original father, Adam. So it was very sadly, very elaborate ruse and myth, enabled him to get the security of a position, which is what he was after. And she, I believe, wrote a book about that. And she also presented a lecture in one of the Sankey lectures and this was, I believe, in 2015, which is again available on the internet. She actually lectured on this at QC Lodge uh, in uh, London, in England, uh, some uh, years as I say, uh, later. But I like to think that we all like to have a hero, and Dunkley was, in many respects, my hero. But the trouble is, it's too good a story. And when you actually look at it in depth, there were occasions when his uh, pension was in actual fact removed only for him to have his um, sponsors or his courtiers to try and get it to uh, reinstate it again, which they did. But as I say, uh, sadly, it's, uh, it, it is what it is. And as you quite rightly say, it can't, can't be proved or disproved but there is this baptismal certificate that exists showing that he was never the um, royal personage's illegitimate son. Okay. Thank you, Mike, for that additional tip bit of information about Dunkerley. And Brian, there are a good few books on Dunkerley out there uh, and you can find them at times uh, on eBay, relatively good price or a books, Brian. So I would encourage you to look at that. So Brian, as usual, uh, can I thank Brother Busowalski uh, for his sojourn across the Atlantic this evening to join us. Bruce, thank you for your service to the Canadian Forces and thank you for your work that you've presented here this evening. It's very much appreciated by myself, the members of the Lodge and all our visitors. Brian, just a, a plug for next week's speaker. Is we've got Brother Ian McIntosh coming back to speak to us. Again, we will be touching on uh, days of Yorn and stories of the Burness family. Uh, so we're, we'll be touching on the military theme again slightly, uh, but this time in the Indian subcontinent and the connections to Forfarshire and Montrose. So we very much look forward to that. Uh, Brian, please sign the virtual tile. Please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I very much look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday evening. As ever, I will unmute everyone now and you can say your good nights and your thank yous to Brother Bruce for an evening well presented. The floor's open, Brian. Thanks very much, Bruce. Thanks. Thank you, brother. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Gordon. Well done, Gordon. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Gordon. Another great night. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Gordon. Cheers, Deb. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, Absolutely super. Thank you very, very much. 
and Gordon, thank you for arranging this. Thank you, Gordon. Well, as usual, you, Brian, I'll thank give you, you your fives in about five seconds. There's still a few of you here. Thank well done. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, Brian, I'll give you five. Four. Well, three. Well, three. <laughs> <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Stay safe. Thank you, Brian, and good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.